deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. Sometimes it's the things right in front of us that are the hardest to see. Don't miss the forest for the trees, hiding in plain sight. And sometimes even when we see it, we pretend that we don't see it. It's easier to just pretend it's not there. And they have a word for that. It's called cognitive dissonance. And the Judeo-Christian Bible of today, the one stapled together in 382 AD that most people are familiar with, is rife with examples, of many of which we've already covered in previous episodes. But today we're going to the root of it all, striking at the root, if you will, in an effort to help us understand one of the most perplexing and troubling verses in both the Judeo-Christian Bible and in the very first Bible of 144 AD. That's right. This verse is in both Bibles. Now, for the former, it's Romans chapter 7, and for the latter, Romans chapter 6. And although there are signs of some editing in the Judeo-Christian version, much to my surprise, it remains largely intact. And what it addresses seems to be striking a chord with many Christians and Catholics alike, especially when viewed through the prism of today's wars and conflicts in the Mideast with Israel and in the Ukraine with Zelensky. Now, when one of these leaders invokes the Old Testament name of Amalek and calls for genocide as we read it in Ezekiel 9.6, you're suddenly forced to defend it. You as a Christian, you're forced to defend it because it's in your Judeo-Christian Bible. Now, you might be saying, wait, how did this happen? I never signed up for this, they say. So they begin to ask, who or what is this Yahweh deity worshipped by the Jews? How did this Yahweh and its Jewish religion get stapled to my Christian Bible in the first place? I mean, I signed up for Jesus and salvation. How did this extra religion and God get made part of the deal? Now, these are all good questions, but for the first Christians, the pre-Nicene Christians, these are questions that nobody would have asked. Why? Well, in the beginning, they had their own Bible, their own God, and their own religion. You see, the first Christian Bible didn't have anything called the Old Testament stapled to it. In fact, there was no such thing as an Old Testament or a New Testament. There was only the Gospel of the Lord and the Apostle Paul's original ten epistles. There were no Torah stories about a Yahweh telling this or that tribe to murder women and children of a competing tribe. No Yahweh, the real estate agent, deciding on who gets what land and evicting squatters. Those were the books and fairy tales of an alien god and an alien religion that was hostile to the Christians. So hostile, in fact, they had Jesus crucified after having attempted to murder him on two prior occasions, once by stoning and another trying to throw him off a cliff in Nazareth. Simply put, there was no love lost between the pre-Nicene Christians and Jews, and stapling that alien religion to their Bible would have been the farthest thing from anyone's mind. In fact, remnants of that hostility can be seen today in the Judeo-Christian Bible. We have Jesus telling them their father is the devil in John 8, 44. Jesus telling them they do not know God and God does not know them. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, even the apostle Paul says about the Jews, quote, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, unquote. And this is because God was only revealed to us through Christ, not before. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament is the name Yahweh, Yehovah, or Yeshua written even once. Go ahead and look. Pause the episode and look. You'll find it's not there. Anyway, those three quick scriptural examples, not to mention many others, would probably be enough uh, prima facie evidence that in the very least, Something isn't adding up with this stapled together Bible. Trying to mix Jesus in with this psychotic Yahweh deity, well, it's like 
trying to mix oil and water. You can stir until your arm falls off, but it ain't mixing. And that brings us back in a roundabout way to these verses in Romans chapter 6. Now, after reading them, you may very well come to the same conclusion that millions of the pre-Nicene Christians did. The Apostle Paul was warning us to steer clear of that Torah Old Testament, warning us not even to look at it or read it. But could just some translated Hebrew words on paper really be that dangerous? Well, let's open up Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 11. And by the way, you can get your own copy of the original Christian Bible free at theveryfirstbible.org. But if you'd rather read it from today's edited Bible, you'll find these same verses in chapter 7. And it begins. Therefore, my brothers, you also were made dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you would be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bring forth fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were through the law worked in our members to bring forth fruit to death. But now we have been discharged from the law, having died to that in which we were held, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. However, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known coveting unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, finding occasion through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of coveting, for, apart from the law, sin is dead. I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. The commandment, which was for life, this I found to be for death, for sin, finding occasion through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Now, before we go any further, let's get a little context and address some questions right up front. Did the pre-Nicene Christians believe that Yahweh was actually Satan? Well, the answer is yes and no. Many did, and they believed this deity had power on earth, uh, aiding his cult members as a way to further his own goals of the spiritual destruction for the rest of us. But some thought this Yahweh deity was simply the product of the psychotic fever dream imaginations of the Jews themselves, created out of whole cloth and used as a fairy tale weapon to intimidate their tribal enemies. Basically, they say, a desert war god, but one of many that was worshipped at the time. Chemosh, Baal, Molech being just a few of the others. And at one time or another, monolatrous Jews also worshipped and did human sacrifices to these other desert war gods, just as we find it written in 1 Kings 11.7. And by the way, that will be my last direct reference to anything contained in these Torah books for obvious reasons. So back to the Apostle Paul's warning to stay away from the Old Testament Torah books. He describes how these alien words can impact you and cause impure thoughts that beget real-world action. Now, we're entering into a rather esoteric discussion because we don't know or understand the mechanisms involved. For example, we read in the first Bible of unclean spirits and how they're exercised by Jesus and his apostles, but we don't understand fully how they operate, how they are drawn to one person but not another. What attracts them? Simply the act of sinning? Perhaps merely the thought of sinning? An act carried out only in the mind? Perhaps just knowledge of various sins is enough to call them to carve out a space within you? And the Old Testament Torah books certainly are a laundry list of sins and the most vile and disgusting acts imaginable. And these are said to be the very words of Yahweh himself. But we don't have the knowledge of their workings. I mean, what are we tinkering with here? This is like handing a toddler a grenade and waiting for him to eventually get curious enough to pull the pen. And knowledge, isn't that an interesting word? If I have knowledge of something, it becomes part of the way in which I view and 
interact with the rest of the world, does it not? Do I not find myself projecting that knowledge onto others, or assume that they also have the same sins and secrets? Say, for example, the knowledge of good and evil. Here, let's read that warning again. I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known coveting unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, finding occasion through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of coveting, for, apart from the law, sin is dead. Now let's think about that. All kinds of coveting. Coveting in ways that probably wouldn't have even occurred to you in a whole lifetime had you not been exposed to the knowledge of it and stories celebrating it. Now, are we saying that ignorance is bliss? No. What we're discussing isn't just the veneer of benign knowledge, but rather the weaponized mass marketing of sinful, carnal knowledge, spiritual pornography, if you will. And that Old Testament Torah reads like an instruction manual from Gehana, the pit of hell. Your children should not be exposed to it. No benefit can come to them from reading it. Simply put, these laws and commandments were written by Jews for Jews. One set of laws for them and one set for anyone that's not a Jew. In fact, they have 613 of these laws and commandments. But these are not the ways of our people. As Christians, we have but one overarching law, a single penultimate commandment that guides our behavior and interactions with others. And it is written in a way that does not beget and encourage sin. It does not expose us to weaponized carnal knowledge, and its words are as follows. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, as Christians, we don't wear red strings on our wrist. We don't dabble in Kabbalah spells. We don't play number games with gematria and twirl magic chickens over our heads. That's not our book, not our God, not our religion. And according to Bishop Andrew Theophilus of the Marcionite Christian Church, it would appear that the Christian world right now has reached an inflection point, a point where you're going to have to make a choice between this Yahweh deity of an alien religion and God our Father is revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. Now, many Western denominations have already chosen poorly as they embrace and encourage sodomites and wash their hands of core Christian doctrine and dogma. And as a result, their parishioners are fleeing from the church. They're recognizing the danger, and these are the people that we hope to reach before they fall into the trap of atheism or even worse. And if you're one of them, now would be a good time for you to pray to our Father and beseech Him that His Holy Spirit helps you recognize the people and institutions that seek to subvert your faith. In the world of nature, it's called aposematism. It's a fancy Greek word describing the use of a signal, and especially a visual signal, of conspicuous markings or bright colors by an animal to warn others that it is toxic or distasteful. You see, they're hiding in plain sight, but you need to have spiritual discernment, spiritual aposematism to know what they look like, know their fruits. Remember, made-up words like Judeo-Christian aren't going to cut it. The days of magic thinking and cognitive dissonance are over. Are you ready to make a clean break? You see, nobody knows the formula to be used when all of humanity will be forced to make that final choice. Will it be framed in a way similar to the way in which the world was forced to choose between taking a bioweapon injection or refusing it a few years ago? Well, nobody knows, but all will submit to the choice. And remember, when the Yahweh apologists come to trick and beguile you with word games and dances on the head of a pin, remember 1 Corinthians 14.23, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace.
I hope you enjoyed today's episode, maybe got something out of it. And I'll remind you that the best and only donation that we accept are your prayers for us. No earthly price can be put on such a thing. But you can help reach other lost Christians by sharing the episodes on whatever social media that you frequent. And lastly, the Marcionite Christian Church has approved a new translation for the very first Bible, and the French version will now be joining English, Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese, available for free downloading in PDF and ebook formats. And by the way, these aren't machine translations or produced using AI. Every word and nuance is translated by a human native speaker and reviewed by the church. And you can find that link at theveryfirstbible.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Kalama for Pre-Nicene Perspective, and we'll see you next time. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. 10 books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.